In Lecture 24b, we looked at the very important concept of diagonalization of a square matrix. It's often possible, but it's not always possible. We continue with that here in Lecture 25b. I will review the diagonalization theorems, our main theorems from 24b. We'll look at a 2 by 2 example where it's not diagonalizable. It is actually the one that I mentioned at the end of 24b. We will look at a 3 by 3 example and look at the details of diagonalizing that. We could certainly do that in the case where we have three distinct real eigenvalues, then we would know it would be diagonalizable. But in this case, it's only going to have two distinct real eigenvalues. One of them is going to be repeated with multiplicity 2. You're not guaranteed diagonalizability in that case, but in this case, it is. It is diagonalizable. And then we'll apply that diagonalization via what I call the beautiful generalizations in 25a to linear difference and differential equations. Okay? So continuing with diagonalization, a very, very, very important topic in linear algebra. <clears throat> so let's start by reviewing the theorems. There is the diagonalization theorem itself, the thing that's actually labeled that way. But the other two theorems I'm going to show you are still related to diagonalization. An n by n matrix. A is diagonalizable over the real numbers. You can talk about diagonalizability over complex numbers. I think I probably will mention how that goes, but not in this lecture. If and only if A has n linearly independent real eigenvectors. eigenvectors excuse me. A is n by n. It's got to have n linearly independent eigenvectors. I'm not talking at all in this sort of sentence about eigenvalues. It's not clear what eigenvalues these eigenvectors go with. It's possible you could even have an eigenspace that's two-dimensional going with one eigenvalue. That's possible. And in fact, it will happen in our main example. That's 3 by 3 here. In other words, A is diagonalizable. I'll remind you what that means if and only if it has a list of eigenvectors that form a basis for Rn, called an eigenvector basis. Furthermore, we can say that A is similar to a diagonal matrix. That's what diagonalizability means. It's hard to say. Again, I don't even know if it's a word, diagonalizability. That's what it means. A is similar to a diagonal matrix. That means there's an invertible matrix P and a diagonal matrix D, so that A equals P times D times P inverse. And when we write it this way, P, the first matrix on the right, the one on the left here, left side of the right, has columns that are eigenvectors of A, and linearly independent ones, in fact, so that P is invertible by the invertible matrix theorem, and you put its inverse on the right there. And in that case, the entries on the main diagonal of D, the diagonal matrix, are going to be the corresponding eigenvectors in the same order. So if lambda 1 is the in the top upper left entry of D, first column, that's going to be an eigenvalue for the eigenvector that's in the first column of P, etc. They're in the same order. Here's another theorem that's easily, easy to prove based on the diagonalization theorem and also um, another theorem that we had a few lectures ago. An n by n matrix with n distinct real eigenvalues is diagonalizable. If you know you have all distinct eigenvalues, it will be diagonalizable. That is actually the usual case. If you're thinking in terms of creating matrices with random entries, if you create a matrix with truly random entries, it will have n distinct eigenvalues with probability 1. The case where that doesn't happen is special. I have the cases. I have to try to work to come up with examples where that doesn't happen. <clears throat> but the special cases are still important. And then the final theorem is let A be an n by n matrix. We've got three parts to this. I'm supposing the distinct real eigenvalues of A are lambda 1 through lambda P. P is going to be less than or equal to N. And again, the case where P is less than N is the more difficult case to think about. Some of those could have multiplicity greater than 1. Part A says that the dimension of the eigenspace, what you might call the geometric multiplicity of lambda K, is always less than or equal to the algebraic multiplicity of lambda k as a root of the characteristic k 
characteristic polynomial. So the, if lambda k had multiplicity 2, for example, its eigenspace is either going to be one dimensional or two dimensional. Can't be zero dimensional dimensional because eigenvectors by definition have to be non-zero, although the eigenspace includes the zero vector. So again, if lambda k had multiplicity two, the dimension of the eigenspace would either have to be one or two. If the dimension of the uh, <coughs> multiplicity of lambda k has a really characteristic polynomial is three, then the dimension of the eigenspace for that value of lambda could be one or two or three. Part B says, A is diagonaliz diagonalizable if and only if the sum of the dimensions of the distinct eigenvalues, eigenspaces equals n. And this happens based on part A, if and only if the dimension of the eigenspace for each lambda k equals the algebraic multiplicity of that lambda k. It's, I guess it's not based on that, but it's related to it. So if lambda k has an algebraic multiplicity of 2, and if the dimension of the eigenspace for that lambda k is 2, and if that kind of thing happens for all these lambdas, then A will be diagonalizable. Last one looks like this. If A is diagonalizable and BK is a basis for the eigenspace corresponding to lambda K for each K, K goes from 1 to P, then the total collection of all the vectors in those sets combined forms an eigenvector basis for Rn. It's written as a one-directional implication, but you really could write a converse to this. You could say, if I've got these distinct eigenspaces and all of them together forms an eigenvector basis of Rn, then A will be diagonalizable because that, those vectors are going to be n-linearly independent eigenvectors for A. All right, so those are the theorems. For the rest of this period, this video, we're going to look at examples now. Why can't some matrices be diagonalized? An example. It's the example I mentioned at the end of lecture 24 B. This matrix. It's an upper triangular matrix. Its eigenvalues are in the main diagonal. They're both one. There's only one eigenvalue to this. It's the number one. And it occurs with multiplicity two. But the multiplicity has nothing to do with that number being two. Maybe I should have picked a different example. In fact, I can put any non-zero number up there and the resulting matrix with 1, 1 here and here and a 0 there will not be diagonalizable. That can't be diagonalized, turns out. Evidently, we should be able to prove that with the diagonalization theorem. And I will mention how you prove it here in a second. But what if we try to diagonalize it with some invertible matrix P, whose entries I'm leaving unspecified. What if we tried to diagonalize it? What would prevent it from working? We might wonder. Why is it not diagonalizable based on the diagonalization theorem? Well, remember, its eigenvalue is 1. So I need to consider A minus lambda I, where lambda is 1, and ask if I consider the corresponding system of equations to solve for x in this homogeneous system here, what are the solutions? Those are going to be the eigenvectors corresponding to this eigenvalue of 1. A minus i, the 2 by 2 identity matrix, think about it here, is going to be 0, 2, 0, 0. And as an augmented matrix for a homogeneous system, well, it's essentially already in re reduced row echelon form. And that corresponds to the first line, essentially just y has to be 0. But x can be anything, because there's a 0 times x plus a 1 times y equals 0. y would have to be 0, but x is free. It's not a typical thing that happens when we compute eigenvectors. And so eigenvectors are going to be any non-zero multiples of the vector 1, 0. Those will be eigenvectors, and any eigenvector will be a non-zero multiple of this. And in fact, the eigenspace will be all scalar multiples of this, including the zero vector. The eigenspace is the horizontal axis. And nothing else. 
a one-dimensional eigenspace in spite of the fact that this has a two-dimensional eigenvalue, I should say an eigenvalue of multiplicity two. The characteristic polynomial here can be factored as lambda minus one quantity squared. Multiplicity two. But we do not have two linearly independent eigenvectors. So therefore, by the bi diagonalization theorem, it's not diagonalizable. But let's just try this experiment anyway, just see what happens. Compute away. Compute P inverse AP and ask yourselves, are there any things you can choose for A, B, C, and D that would make it diagonal? And evidently it won't happen, so what's preventing it from being diagonal? We'll do it in this order to get a possibly diagonal matrix. Well, remember the shortcut formula for the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. We'll take one of the determinant of P, which I'm just going to call D for short. Then you swap the numbers in the main diagonal. The A and the D get swapped. I'm looking at this matrix P here. And you negate the numbers in the, the off diagonal. This would be P inverse is, is this thing. Times A times P. What I do next, I multiply these two to get this. Double check it. 1 times A plus 2 times C is in the upper left corner. 1 times B plus 2 times D is in the upper right corner. 0 times A plus 1 times C, C is in the lower left corner. And 0 times B plus 1 times D, D is in the lower right corner. Now multiply these two matrices. You can check that you get this mess, which does simplify a bit. The BDs cancel here and here. The ACs cancel here and here. You can rearrange here if you like, and in fact I did essentially, I combined the AD minus BC and wrote it as capital D here and down here just to make it a little simpler looking. When would this be a diagonal matrix? It would be diagonal if and only if these numbers on the off diagonal are both zero. Can that happen? The only way this last matrix right here can be diagonal is if both C equals 0 and D equals 0 to make both of those numbers 0. But wait a minute. If C and D are both 0, then P has a row of zeros. Not 0, excuse me, a determinant of 0. It wouldn't be invertible. Its determinant would be 0. I could, I, I'd be dividing by 0 there. That's what's stopping it. Okay? This then is a brute force way to confirm non diagonalizability diagonalizability for this example. Okay? I could try for three by three cases too, but I think I don't really want to go there. This is one example enough. Okay? Here's our main example for this lecture. A three by three diagonalizable example, though it's only going to have two real distinct eigenvalues, evidently one of which if it's going to be diagonalizable, must have not only algebraic multiplicity 2, but geometric multiplicity 2. The dimension of the eigenspace must be 2 in order for it to be diagonalizable. So that's what we should expect. It's good to think about what to expect when you look at the problem phrasing or you hear what I say verbally. So here's our matrix. And I did happen to pick this matrix so that the eigenvalues are nice numbers, integers. In general, you pick a random 3 by 3 matrix. The eigenvalues are probably going to be irrational numbers or maybe complex numbers that have irrational real and imaginary parts. At least the imaginary part. I, yeah. I made it work out nice. It's not clear that it's going to. What's the characteristic polynomial? Do we really want to calculate it? Yeah, I want to go through the details here. Okay. So I'm going to show you a bunch of details. I'm not going to take the time to check every single little detail. Maybe I'll highlight a few things here and there. It is still the determinant of A minus lambda I, but now I is the 3 by 3 identity matrix. So this is the same matrix as this one here, except the numbers of the main diagonal you end up subtracting lambda from. We take the determinant of that to get the characteristic polynomial. It's going to be a cubic in lambda. Do our standard cofactor expansion across the top row. 
treating lambda as a constant, I get one minus lambda times the determinant of this two by two submatrix, which is what you see there, minus the number there, which is 16, times the determinant of another two by sub two by submatrix. Delete the row and column that 16 is in, and look at what's left, and look at the determinant I'm taking over there. Then add 12 times the determinant of this submatrix, which is what you see over there. And those are all two by two matrices. <clears throat> Easy to quickly take the determinants of those. So I get a one minus lambda here and here. The determinant of this is the entire thing inside parentheses here. Double check that. 16 times 6 is 96. I'm subtracting negative 96, which means I'm adding 96. The negative 16 is right here. This determinant is this whole thing. The 12 is right there. This determinant is this whole thing. I did take the time to double and triple check things. I, I'm pretty sure there's no mistakes. I can't guarantee it. All right. What's our goal? Our goal is to find the eigenvalues. Our goal is to factor this in a simple way. Lambda minus something times lambda minus something else times lambda minus something else. Maybe with a coefficient in the very front. In fact, it will be a, a negative coefficient in the very front because the way we're doing it, the characteristic polynomial for a cubic has a negative lambda cube coefficient. You can actually switch the order of these matrices around in here. You can do the determinant of lambda i minus a. And in that case, the characteristic polynomial would be the opposite of what we're doing. But this is good enough. They would still have the same roots. Now just simplify. Multiply this out. 13 times 7 is 91. But it's a 13 times negative 7, excuse me. Negative 91 plus 96 is 5. That's where the 5 comes from. We got a negative 13 lambda there and a plus 7 lambda there. That gives a negative 6 lambda. And negative lambda times negative lambda is lambda squared. These ones are easier to simplify. You can pretty quickly do those. All right, here's the hardest step that is a time-saving step. I have a factor of 1 minus lambda there. Um, and I can factor this as lambda minus 5 times lambda minus 1. If I look at this and this, I realize if I factor a 2 out of that and a 4 out of the, there, I'll be left with lambda minus 5 here and a lambda minus 5 there, meaning every term here has a factor of lambda minus 5. The 32 comes from 2 times 16. The 48 comes from 4 times 12 after factoring out the constants. And because of that, I don't actually have to expand this out completely. I can now factor lambda minus 5 out of everything here, like this. 1 minus lambda times lambda minus 1 is what gives you what you see here. The negative 32 gives you that, and the positive 48 gives you this. Simplify. You're left with this. And I did factor out a negative 1 in front as well that negative lambda squared, I decided to factor a lambda, a negative one out of everything. And the two lambda becomes a negative two lambda, and 48 minus 32 minus one, which is 15, becomes negative 15, because I factored out a negative one. And now this is factorable. This thing is lambda minus five times lambda plus three. So the ultimate factorization is this, which tells you the roots, the eigenvalues, are 5 and negative 3. Negative 3 has algebraic multiplicity 1. Positive 5 has algebraic multiplicity 2. It comes from looking at that power. It's, it's called a double root. So we're wondering what's going to happen here. I already told you what's going to happen. This is diagonalizable. The eigenspace for lambda's negative 3 is going to be one-dimensional. The eigenspace for lambda's positive 5 is going to be two-dimensional. That's not guaranteed to happen without actually doing the calculations. It's possible that in spite of the two there, the dimension of the eigenspace could still be one, as happened with our 
two by two example that we looked at. But let's compute. There's A. If you plug in lambda 1 equals negative 3 into A minus lambda i, <coughs> A minus lambda i, when i is negative 3, becomes A plus 3i, when lambda is negative 3. So you need to just add 3 to all the diagonal entries. And leave the other one's the same. And that's what I've got right here. 1 plus, look at the upper left corner here, 1 plus 3 is 4. 13 plus 3 is 16. Negative 7 plus 3 is negative 4. All the other numbers are the same. I am talking about an augmented matrix here. I'm thinking about corresponding homogeneous system. Row operations. The reduced row echelon form is this. That's the RREF. The eigenspace is the solution set of that. This line corresponds to x plus z equals 0, so x is negative z. This is y plus a half z is 0, so y is negative 1 half z. z is a free variable. There's only one free variable. This is going to be a one-dimensional eigenspace, and the basis for it, if I pick z to be 2, will be negative 2, negative 1, 2. Notice x is negative z, and y is negative 1 half times z. It's a one-dimensional eigenspace. It's got a basis with one vector. What about the other one that's got algebraic multiplicity 2? Then I need to compute a minus 5i when lambda is 5. 1 minus 5 is negative 4. 13 minus 5 is 8. Negative 7 minus 5 is negative 12. Yeah, look at these numbers, negative 4, 8, negative 12. The other numbers stay the same. Once again, it's an augmented matrix. And hey, lo and behold, rows 2 and 3 are constant multiples of row 1. Row 2 is 1 half row 1. And row 3 is negative of row 1. Negative 1 times row 1. When you row reduce, you're going to get two rows of zeros. And if you think about the equation, you get x minus 4y minus 3z equals 0. So x is positive 4y plus 3z. y and z are free variables, two free variables. And the eigenspace is going to have a basis of two vectors, 4, 1, 0, and 3, 0, 1. If you let y equal 1 and z equal 0, then x is 4y. If you let z equal 1 and y equal 0, then x is 3z. These are linearly, linearly independent vectors, <clears throat> as they will be guaranteed to be based on what I said about finding basis for null space back, I don't know, five, six, seven lectures ago. It's two-dimensional. That, in a sense, is good. We're happy because that means we can diagonalize A. And that helps us solve problems in difference equations and differential equations. So you might want to confirm that it really worked. I created a matrix P whose columns are the eigenvectors. This one for the eigenvalue negative 3, and then these two for the eigenvalue positive 5. I happen to pick that ordering of those columns. I could pick a different order. But if I do pick this order, this one goes with negative 3, so negative 3 has got to be in the first spot on the diagonal matrix D. And these two go with 5, so 5s have to be in the second and third spots on the main diagonal of D. If you switch them around, then those numbers can get switched around too. And again, any non-zero multiples of these columns works as well. And in fact, it, it gives you the same condition here that P times D times P inverse equals A. I did calculate P inverse with Mathematica. There it is. And I did a Mathematica check this calculation. I did not check it by hand. If you're really inspired to put in the effort on this stuff, you can certainly check these things by hand. But now, 
I want to use these things. For difference equations, I want to raise a to a power, which means compute p times d to that same power times p inverse, where p is that and p inverse is that. And d to a power will be a new diagonal matrix where these numbers in the main diagonal are raised to the same power as a is. And then I want to do e to the ta, the matrix exponential, as p times e to the td times p inverse. We talked about this in recent lectures to help us solve differential equations. So this difference equation therefore has this solution. yn will be a to the n times y0, which is pd to the n times p inverse times y0, this. And if you've got the stomach for it, you can check that it equals this. And I did double and triple check this. I'm 99% I'm sure that it's correct with no mistakes. What about a differential equation? Same matrix here. The initial value problem, I'm thinking about y of 0 being y sub 0 and y sub 0 being a vector whose components are little x 0, little y 0, and little z 0. That's the generic initial condition. Use the matrix exponential. e to the ta is p times e to the td times p inverse. Again, I verified that symbolically recently, which means you've got to do all this multiplication. Notice e to the td, since d is diagonal, has your e to the different negative values times t on the main diagonal, and zeros elsewhere. And if you multiply this out, you get this. And the answers, when you compare them, are actually pretty sim similar to each other. Every time there's a negative 3 to the n, negative 3 in parentheses to the n here, there's an e to the negative 3t down there with the same coefficients. And every time there's a 5 to the n up here, there's an e to the 5t down there. You would graph this one as a discrete set of points in three-dimensional space, bouncing around. And in fact, it would do some bouncing back and forth to a certain degree because of the negative 3 to the n powers in these different spots. And this one, where t is a real variable, you'd graph as a parametric curve in three-dimensional space. I'm not going to take the time to do that in this lecture. So I'm to finish here in a minute or two. But let me just show you Mathematica's calculations that helped me do these calculations here. So here I got the matrix A. Here's what its characteristic polynomial looks like when you multiply it all out. And if you multiply it all out like that, that's not super helpful because it's not clear how to factor it. Though if you graphed it, you might be able to guess what the factorization is. In fact, maybe I should graph that real quick here. Plot. This thing is a function of lambda over our eigenvalues. Uh, I forgot already. Negative 3 and 5. So say lambda goes between negative 7 and 7. Crosses, touches the axis at negative 3 and at 5. And at 5, it doesn't cross. It just touches it. It's tangent to the axis at 5. But then that's what it means. It's a double root. That's just a graph of the characteristic polynomial. Like in system for A, Mathematica does give us 5 as a repeated eigenvalue in this list twice, and negative 3 as an eigenvalue of multiplicity 1. These first two vectors are linearly independent vectors for the eigenvalue 5. They are the ones I wrote down, in fact. And this last one is the eigenvector for the eigenvalue negative 3. Here's P, here's D. I have to do a lowercase d in Mathematica because the uppercase d is reserved for differentiation. And here I'm going to compute p times d times p inverse, and that is a. Here I also found the inverse p right there. And here I found a to the nth power with matrix power, and the matrix exponential with matrix x. And I need this extra expand to make it look similar. It looked weird when I didn't include the expand. If you compare these things, you see that they are the same thing that I got before. OK. 
Okay. So, continuing with the stuff, this is again the heart of the course, the hinge of the course, relating stuff that's come before with stuff that's going to come after. What's to come very soon with the linear algebra portion? We're going to relate this now very soon to change of basis, change of coordinates, matrix, and going back to lectures one and two to skewed coordinates, maybe even in the next lecture B. Thanks for watching.